Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Broadcasting System presents Quiet Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please for tonight is called Little Visitor. All I know is there was a train wreck. I don't even remember the train wreck, but they told me about that afterward in the hospital. Twenty years ago seems a long time when you just say it. But after all, it was only 1928, wasn't it? The year after Lindbergh flew the Atlantic, remember? I don't remember, of course. I don't remember anything before the train wreck. Amnesia, they call it. Just like they have on the radio and the soap operas. Only, only when it happens to you, it's very rough not having any childhood to remember. You just think about that for a minute. Think how dull your life would be if you hadn't any school days to remember, if you didn't have any memories of your kid friends. Oh, I've heard you talk about them, comparing notes with other people, laughing, sometimes being very sad when you think of somebody you knew in the eighth grade, and maybe he died in Guadalcanal or someplace. Maybe some of my kid friends did, too. When you get to talking about your childhood memories and... All I can remember back to was the hospital with my head hurting and a lot of people asking me questions that make it hurt worse. So I walk away, and sometimes I cry a little. Grown man crying. Grown man. I don't even know how old I am. I don't know who I am. Really, though, I'm, I'm not full of self-pity all the time. I try to take it in my stride. But a, a thing like this leaves scars. Worse than the one on the back of my head. The name I use is Smith. The doctors at the hospital gave me that name. They gave me my first name, too, which I don't especially like. But the fellow who suggested it was friendly and good to me. So I go through life carrying Ulysses. For a first name. Well, the doctor was a sentimental budget or something, and he was thinking about the old Greek Ulysses who had to wander so far before he finally found his home. Well, I'd wander too, he said, and maybe it'd be a lucky name because old Ulysses finally got home. Maybe I'd get home someday too. So, I'm Ulysses. And I haven't found home yet. But I've made a home, of course. Marjorie and I were married two years ago, and it's, it's all right. But I'd like to find my real home sometime. And remember, I'm a locksmith by trade. They taught me at the hospital. I'm not a very good one, just a journeyman. Of course, you don't really have to be such a high-powered expert like Courtney that died the other day was to get by in this trade. Most of the work you're called on for is simple, making a key, unlocking somebody's luggage, things like that. When a job's too tough for me, there are other locksmiths in town. Well, I get by. Then there's a lot of time to think and try to remember. I keep thinking about kids. The ones I must have played with when I was a kid. And this time of the year, I get to thinking about coasting on a hill somewhere. And I do my best to remember a hill and remember who was with me, but it's always the same. I can't remember. Last Thursday night, I was working in the shop on a late job. A fellow left a a little safe with me. He'd lost a combination. He wasn't sure what was inside it, and he was going away and wanted to get it open. So I put in a little overtime. Fellow said he didn't mind paying for it. So I was all alone. It was close to 12, and I was pretty tired. A long day. I thought I heard somebody at the door, and I looked around. 
There wasn't anybody. I looked at the clock then and saw what time it was and the safe had turned stubborn on me, so I decided to call it a day. I knew Marjorie would be having fits anyway at me being at the shop so late. I was just slipping into my coat when the door opened. Yeah, sure it was locked. But it opened. And there was a kid standing in the doorway, grinning at me. Hi. How'd you get that door open, son? Just opened. Why, I locked it. It opened. What you doing? Well, what are you doing this time of night? Nothing. Hadn't you better be home? Yeah. Your mother will be looking for you. I haven't got any mother. And your father. I haven't got any father either. But you get along home. What you doing? Well, I was trying to open the safe. Scram now. It's full of money? I don't know what's in it. Go on, beat it, son. I'm going to turn out the lights and close up. All right. Want me to walk down the corner someplace with you? Which way are you going? That way. Nah, I don't go that way. Well, you get along home. Okay. So long. Well, I was naturally a little concerned about a kid of that age. He looked to be about eight, running around the streets at midnight. So I snapped the lights off quickly and stepped out the door to catch up with him. When I got outside, there wasn't a sign of him. Well, I got to worrying, but what could I do? So I walked on home, and just like I thought, Marjorie was sore. I don't see why you can't get some kind of work that doesn't keep you up all night. Here you come in, night after night, at all hours. Well, this is the and first I... night I've worked since the week after Thanksgiving, huh? Well, I don't see why you have to work nights at all. Well, I don't like it either, dear, but a man's got to make a living. Yeah, and a fine living it is, too, isn't it? the best I can do, dear. Next thing you know, you'll be asking me to go back to work again. Now, oh, Marjorie, you know better than that. Well, I don't see any other way of getting any decent clothes. I'm sorry, dear. Oh, sorry. Now, you go on to bed, dear. Did you leave me anything to eat? I went to the restaurant. Oh, that's fine, dear. Did you have a good supper? If you think I'm going to stand around and cook and slave for you all day long and then half the night on top of that, well, you've got another thing coming. Oh, of course, dear. Uh, you know, the funniest thing happened tonight. Yeah, for instance. Well, I was just getting ready to come home, and a little boy opened the door. Sure, it wasn't a little girl, about uh, 18. It was a little boy. Yeah. About eight years old. Well, what did he want? Nothing. He just stood there a minute. Mm, you'd think people could keep their breaths off the street. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. You know, he was the... Strangest kid, Marge. How? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Make up your mind. Well, he... The clothes he wore, they were... You know, kind of old-fashioned. <laughs> oh, how would you know? That's right, Marjorie, I wouldn't know. I don't ever remember seeing any old-fashioned clothes. But I've seen pictures of them, I guess, or, or something... Anyway, he didn't look like other kids. Oh, you and your kids. That's all you think about. I wish we had a kid. Well, I'm glad we haven't. One big lummox around here is plenty. There's a can of salmon in the cupboard. I'm going to bed. I don't like salmon very well, but uh, don't get me wrong. I love Marjorie. I know it's tough on her being married to a guy that just barely gets by at his trade. And I make a lot. Only I... I wish she'd be sweet just once in a while. Like she used to be. When we were first married. I couldn't get that kid off my mind. I went to sleep and dreamed about him. I guess it was the salmon. I dreamed about him getting run over by a streetcar, falling in that ditch that they end under the powerhouse. Sound like an old woman, don't I? But, well, you see, when you got the thing wrong with you that I have, that blackout, well, you see. Anyway, I remember how the dream ended. Well, I saw the kid standing in front of me in those funny old-fashioned clothes, and he spoke to me. Don't you worry about me, Ulysses. I'll be seeing you. And I woke up with a start. And I could have sworn that boy was standing alongside the bed in the half-dark. But when I turned on the light, there was nobody there. 
Marjorie says, for Pete's sake, if I can't sleep, at least let her sleep. That was on a Thursday. I got to thinking the next morning about the boy. The way he seemed so real in my dream. But he didn't show up. And I guess I wasn't very surprised at that. The safe turned out to be a much tougher job than I expected, and I couldn't pry it open. I worked till about ten, and I know now why I did. I was expecting the kid to pop in. The ideas a fella gets. I stay away from talking to kids, you see, because I don't know how to talk to them. I can't talk their language. I don't know it. But this little devil, there was something about him that made me feel we could sort of talk brother talk to each other. Something familiar about him, if if you see what I mean. I I kind of felt that I really knew him. Well, he didn't show up. Saturday, I worked all day. No luck with the safe. The man was getting pretty impatient because he was leaving town the following Tuesday. He wanted to see what was in it. You know, in this business, you run into people like that. A closed door or a locked strong box, they got more curiosity than that cat. Well, he said, keep on, so I did. I figured even if Marjorie didn't like my being away at the shop all the time, she'd feel better when she saw the overtime money the job was going to pay. So I worked Sunday. I don't know how he got in. Maybe I did leave the door unlocked. But there he was, grinning at me. Haven't you got it open yet? What are you doing here? Can I watch you? Well, uh, you sure you ought to be here? Sure. What's your name? Jeffrey. Jeffrey what? Jeffrey Briggs. My name's Ulysses. Ain't either. Sure it is. You made that up. Oh, it's my name. Okay. But I bet it ain't. Well, it is. All right. Haven't you got that thing open yet? Yeah, it's a harder job than I thought. I used to open boxes and things. You did? You bet. I opened one once that had a lot of money in it. Good. Two dollars. What'd you do with the two dollars? I spent it. What kind of box was this, Jeffrey? It was green. Kind of tin. It was my grandfather's. And he had you open it for him? Oh, no. He didn't know it. Oh, I see. And he didn't know the two dollars was in it. Well, don't you think it was bad to take your grandfather's money? Why? He didn't know it was there. Well... You know how I opened the box? How? I hit it. Well, you can't open a safe that way, Jeffrey. I bet you can. No, you can't. I bet you. I'll show you. You see? You see? Ooh, look what's inside. It's money. It's money. It's a million dollars. Hey, does the man know the money's in there? I know, son. He doesn't. Oh, goody, goody. Then... Then you can keep it, can't you? The boy's eager eyes followed every move I made in my coming of money. There was fifty-three thousand dollars. There was an old notebook and a half a dozen letters. That was all. I guess I sat there quite a while holding a thick pile of bills and thinking. And Jeffrey's eyes never left my face. He didn't say a word. But he didn't need to. I heard him once. You can see her, can't you? And then the telephone rang. Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Murphy. Yes, sir. I just got it open. Yes, you can come over and pick it up whenever you want to. What? No. No, there there wasn't anything in it except an old notebook and some letters. No, not a thing. And then I put down the phone, and I turned back to Jeffrey. Jeffrey wasn't there. But from somewhere, not far away, I heard him laughing. That's a kill. I was surprised how easy it was. 
Mr. Murphy never questioned me. He paid me, and I took my pay home and gave it to Marjorie, and she bought a new dress. She, she even kissed me. But the $53,000, that I put in my bottom bureau drawer under my shirts. I don't know what I intended to do with it. Maybe I was going to give it to Murphy. Maybe not. I don't know. Really, I don't. I know what I did, of course. You've come to that. As a matter of fact, what I thought about most was Jeffrey. An innocent kid. And he led me into this. He didn't see anything wrong about it. What kind of man is he going to grow up to be? Oh, yes, I dreamed. I dreamed lots of things, but mostly about a small boy in old-fashioned clothes who taught me how to be a thief. Jeffrey didn't come to the shop again. And it was the following Wednesday, last Wednesday, that I discovered the money was gone. I thought at once of the boy, if he could get into my shop, why couldn't he get into the house? He'd stolen two dollars. What I'd taken was just more money to him. But I discovered what had become of the money. At breakfast. I think you ought to have some new uh, shirts, Ulysses. And my heart nearly stopped. That was all she said. That was all, but it was enough. I don't think my face gave me away. Well, maybe it did, because she said one more thing just as I was leaving. Is there a reward for stolen money, you listen? So it was Marjorie, of course. And I knew what would happen. Whatever Marjorie's fault, she was honest, straight-laced, fiercely honest. She wouldn't hesitate a moment to turn me in if she thought I'd stolen well, I had stolen. I'd thought about giving the money back to Murphy, as I told you, but now it was too late. If I confessed to Marjorie and asked her for the money to give it back, well, in, in Marjorie's mind, the crime had been committed. She'd see that I was punished for it. The only thing that prevented her now was the fact that she didn't know where it had come from. If she found out, when she found out, there was no way out. And head down thinking furiously. I was unaware for a moment of the eight-year-old skipping gaily by my side. Hey, where are you going? Why, why, hello, Jeffrey. Hi. Where'd you come from? I was just walking along. You going to your shop? I guess so. You know where I'm going? Where? I'm going coasting. Jeffrey, listen. What? Jeffrey, you know... the money... You still got it? No. Who's got it? I think my wife has. Yeah, that's bad, isn't it? Yes, it is. I wouldn't let anybody take my money. I didn't want her to take this money. Well, I'm going coasting. So long. Uh, wait a minute, Jeffrey. I can't wait. The kids are waiting for me up on Normal Hill. Where? On Normal Hill. Hey, did she really take it? I'm afraid she did. Well, why don't you stab her? What? I stabbed an Indian once. Made him dead. An Indian? Oh, it was only my sister's doll. But I played it was an Indian. I stabbed it. Stab, stab, stab. Well, so long. Uh, uh, Jeffrey. Here. You take my pocket knife. Well, what for? In case you want to stab her. You'll make her dead. Goodbye. Uh, Jeffrey. Uh, wait. I'll see you up on Normal Hill, huh? <laughs> I keep wishing Marjorie hadn't come to the shop that afternoon. I wish she hadn't seen the safe lying there on the workbench where Murphy had left it because it was useless. And I wish she hadn't accused me point blank of stealing that money. Because maybe I wouldn't have stabbed her and made her dead. But I did, and I left her there in the lock shop with Jeffrey's pocket knife alongside her. And I went home and I turned the house upside down looking for the money. But I couldn't find it. I didn't have very much of my own, but I bought a ticket and I got on a train. And finally I got off. I didn't know what to do. I had breakfast and I started to walk around the town of Kalamazoo, Michigan. I don't know why I got off the train there, you see. I, I just got off. I walked down Portage Street and that name seemed so familiar. 
I saw a man crossing a street, and I said to myself, that man's name is Harry Oswald. How did I know that? I walked along a lot of streets, and then I was on a street called Davis Street, and kids were coasting down a big high hill on the other side of the street, and I felt funny all of a sudden. I called to one of the kids, and I said, hey, kid, what's the name of that hill? And the kid came closer, and it was Jeffrey. And he said, hi, mister. You came home, huh? And I said again, what's the name of that hill? Well, that's Normal Hill, mister, where I said I'd meet you. Don't you remember? And I turned away, and suddenly everything was familiar to me. I knew where I was. I remembered Normal Hill. And the West Street Hill, where we used to go sometimes, and riding a bobsled hits down to Britt McElroy's old reel. And I turned and... Walked up the steps of a house there on Davis Street, and I opened the door, and I said, Hello, Aunt Nellie. And Aunt Nellie jumped up and spilled her crocheting on the floor, and she said just what I knew she was going to say. Why, Jeffrey Briggs, you haven't changed a particle. And then she fainted. Well, it took a lot of explanation how I'd lost my memory and all that. And she told me about... The time you broke open your grandfather's strong box. And about the other time. When you stabbed your sister's doll and came and told us you'd made her dead. And we had a nice visit together. And then I came away. Yes, I'm going back and give myself up. What else can I do? Aunt Nellie would never know that Ulysses Smith was once... I I said I'd wondered what kind of a man little Jeffrey would grow up to be. Well, you know now. He grew up to be a thief and a murderer. I guess I am the only man in the world that was haunted by himself. <laughs> to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Ulysses, the man who talked to you, was Ernest Chappell. And Michael Artist was young Jeffrey. Audrey Christie was Marjorie. And Aunt Nellie was played by Charmaine Allen. The accompanying music for Quiet, Please is composed and played by Albert Berman. And now for a word about next week's Quiet, Please, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Next week, I have a story for you called The Room Where the Ghosts Lived. That is, if ghosts do live. Maybe we'll find out next week. comes to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Stay with us for And Now with Beyond Gambling, which follows station identification. Leading personalities of the Republican Party will hold a national radio rally over WOR at half past 11 tonight. Republican plans for 1948 will be discussed by Senator Robert A. Taft, Speaker of the House Joseph Martin, Jr., and many others. Here are the National Republican Radio Rally tonight at half past 11. W-O-R, New York.